everyone, thank you for joining today. Um, this week's edition of the Finos uh, Open Source Readiness Working Group. Uh, today we have with us Kathleen Liu. Uh, Kathleen is uh, an, an IP attorney who, uh, who works on open data issues among many other things at Mapbox. Mapbox is a company that provides a platform and APIs for web and mobile developers to access uh, mapping data, turn-by-turn um, -turn directions, et cetera, et cetera. They make a really cool product. Um, and among other things, the mapping space is one area where open data is uh, particularly uh, relevant and widely used um, basically due to the, um, and now I'm going to forget the name of the project. Kathleen, you want to step in here? Uh, open open street map. <laughs> yes, open street maps project, which is, is licensed under the open database license, uh, as I understand it. Um, so I asked Kathleen to come in uh, and talk to us today because I think that open data is going to be something that's increasingly interesting and relevant to those of us in the financial services space. Um, so I asked her to share her experience with um, open data licensing and how it's different from open source licensing and, and what to do and what not to do when you're getting into open data. Uh, so Kathleen, uh, feel free to add to my introduction and take it away. Um, thanks, Aaron. Uh, no, that was that was great. Um, so uh, I will just do like a overview of um, the open data licensing landscape. Um, and uh, if you have questions, you know, feel free to uh, type them into chat, and then Aaron will like stop me at the end of a slide um, and ask me the questions. Uh, so feel free to put your questions in. Um, during the presentation, they don't have to all wait for the end. Okay, so um, just so you know where we're headed, these are the topics that I am going to cover. So we're going to talk about um, open data as a as a concept, uh, especially compared to open source. Um, we're going to talk about the laws um, that are relevant in this space. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the different licenses that are available. Um, and then we're going to talk about you know, practical considerations um, when you're entering this space. Uh, the disclaimer is, of course, I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Um, so why, why would you want to enter the open data space? Um, so this is a definition. Um, of open from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, you're probably familiar with it, um, you know, from open source space, right? Um, conceptually, uh, open data is very similar to open source. You know, the, the idea that open means anyone can freely access, use, modify, and share for any purpose, uh, subject at most to requirements that preserve provenance and openness. So, Open data have and open source have very similar uh, what I would call frameworks and goals. Um, as we saw on the previous slide, the goal of openness is basically, you know, we want this out there. Uh, we want it to be used. We want it to be freely shared. Um, and you know, with within limitations. So the the general framework of open data licenses is similar to the general framework of open source licenses. Um, you see a lot of attribution clauses. Um, you see attempts to uh, have uh, essentially a share alike format um, similar to what you might see in GPL or AGPL. Um, I assume you are, are all very, very familiar with the open source landscape, so I'm not going to go um, into detail um, on those things. But please, you know, stop me and ask me to explain further um, if I'm going into deep. Uh, what's different about open data is a lot of it comes from the legal landscape that surrounds data versus code. Um, and I'm going to talk about this more in detail, but the laws that govern open data are simply different than the laws that govern open source. And that tends to affect um, what you can do on the licensing front, even if it doesn't affect the intent. Um, 
Another thing about uh, open data that tends to be different is where the data, the open data tends to come from. Um, with open source, you, you, know, you see all kinds, right? You see individuals who write some code um, and put it up in a GitHub repo and, you know, turns out apparently, you know, 20,000 companies use that tiny little snippet, um, uh, that tiny little NPM module uh, that one person wrote, you know, five years ago. Um, with open data, you can have individuals put up data, but it tends to be larger entities just because they tend to be the people who already have the data. Um, a lot of governments uh, will uh, put out open data, uh, which is pretty different from open source. You don't see a lot of open source coming from government entities. You see it more and more now than you used to, but governments I think have been really latecomers on the open source side, whereas governments have really been leaders on the open data side. Um, a lot of governments have found that they can better serve their constituents by making large swaths of their data available. Um, and in the United States in particular, there's a culture of this where you know, federal data especially um, has long been very available to everyone. And uh, a lot, there are many states that have FOIA laws, um, Freedom of Information Act or similar laws that make uh, state data also uh, widely available. Um, the, the user pool um, differs somewhat. Um, I, I would say that you know, there are definitely people who um, who uh, are hobbyists um, who are using open data, um, but there are also uh, a lot of companies who are using open data, um, and uh, there are a lot of governments who are essentially trying to pool their data um, so that they can, you know, get more insight. Um, there are a lot more researchers, I think, who use open data than their, uh, they, than open source. Um, I think the academic community is very heavily dependent on open data um, and uh, uses it quite a bit um, for research purposes, um, far more so uh, than, than open source. So uh, this is a question mostly from the perspective of if you have data and you want to put that data out there somehow, um, you want to license it somehow, uh, should you apply an open data license uh, to that data? And I think you'll recognize that these pros and cons are very similar to the pros and cons uh, considered in open source. Um, on the pros, uh, you have collaboration. Uh, you have people who might help clean up your data. Um, same, you know, as if they were fixing bugs in your code um, or add to it. Um, uh, it does enable transparency, um, especially, this is again, especially important to um, academics and to academic research. Um, but of course, you know, if you open, if you open license something, right, uh, then literally anybody can use it. Um, and there is uh, a loss of control in that respect. And very similar to open source, um, once you put something out there, you know, if it's in a GitHub repo or on a web page, uh, there are certain expectations from the public at large, especially if your source gets popular. Um, people might expect you to fairly or unfairly expect you to keep it up to date. Um, 
and uh, people, you know, may uh, download your data a lot, um, and you may just, you know, have server issues um, hosting that much data uh, if it gets really popular. Um, and of course, people might you you know the, this is the both a pro and a con, right? People will use that open data for things that you never imagined, um, and sometimes that's going to be amazing, um, and sometimes you're going to be dismayed. Um, and that is, of course, just the nature of open. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the legal landscape next. Um, do we have any questions so far? Not, not yet, no. Okay. Um, so what's very interesting about data, uh, I'm going to start with the U.S. first, is that data in large part is not copyrightable in the United States. Um, facts are not copyrightable. The selection of arrangement of facts can be copyrightable if it's original selection. Um, but the Courts have said that basic arrangements um, like alphabetical, um, in numerical order, chronological order, these are not original. And so you can imagine that some of the most useful ways to organize data are not copyrightable. And oftentimes the data itself is not copyright. So for example, um, if you have a list of all of the addresses in a town, Right, the the fact that those are the addresses for buildings, and those buildings are in that town, that's not copyrightable. If you put them in or, organized by, say, street name and then by street number, that's not an original um, organization. Um, and of course, with modern databases, since databases can be reordered very, very easily um, just by choosing to index on a different field. Uh, it's very, very easy to copy what is essentially the database without copying the arrangement. Um, what's So this, this case, Feist versus Rural Telephone Service, um, is a uh, it is sort of the source of um, this concept uh, that facts are not copyrightable. Um, and in that case involved a telephone book. Um, so this was a list of names, phone numbers, and addresses for uh, the people who lived in um, this county. Uh, the publisher actually included some fake um, names like uh, in there and the whole thing was copied, but the Supreme Court found that there was no copyright infringement. Um, and then another thing that's notable is if you simply digitize something that is not copyrightable, you know, in the public domain or something, um, you know, putting it into your own format, that's not uh, creative, that's not creative. Um, so that like by itself is not gonna add originality. Um, so the this is a little different um, internationally um, where, you know, um, as you probably know, copyright law is jurisdictional, so it is different in every country. Um, there is an uh, older theory of uh, sweat of the brow, which is cop the idea that copyright protection should apply when somebody has put forward a great deal of effort into something. Um, and under that theory, uh, which was, you know, what the court considered and discarded in Feist um, the, because uh, somebody puts a great deal of effort into putting together a database. 
um, that database should have copyright protection. Um, a lot of countries have a creativity, creativity threshold that is higher than the one in the US. Uh, the US only requires a modicum of creativity, um, but uh, as we saw in Feist, um, facts are insufficient. So um, one thing of note is that um, in Europe, uh, Europe has adopted sui generis uh, protection for databases. So they have a special database protection law, which uh, provides 15 years of protection. So a lot shorter than copyright. Um, the U.S. has at times, you know, considered uh, going the European route, and and uh, Congress has not not done it. Um, but and there are like a few other countries that have also considered this, but EU is really the big jurisdiction um, where this is a consideration. Um, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen with the UK uh, since Brexit. Um, it's still unclear, I think, how they are going to sort out all of the IP issues. Um, everything pre-existing will continue to have the protection for the term, um, but they're going to have to sort out um, whether they are going to uh, adopt those protections. Uh, going forward or not. Um, so basically, what Europe has done has is they've decided we're going to protect that effort. Um, we think it's valuable. We don't think it's the same as copyright. Um, we don't think it's the same as you know a novel um, or a movie. But we think that putting together a database um, is something that we want to financially incentivize and offer um, a shorter duration of protection. Um, and the protection, the rights that it protects is very, very similar to copyright. Um, you know, protecting against unauthorized access and unauthorized duplication. Um, so another area of law that's relevant to uh, open licensing than to licensing in general is contract law, right? Contracts are an agreement between you and whoever, you know, whoever you enter into the contract with, whoever is a recipient of the license. So in this respect, uh, it is very, very similar uh, to open source where there is the potential of a contractual claim if somebody violates an open source license. Where this is different than open source is often uh, under open source, if they don't abide the light by the license, then the claim is, well, you don't have a license, therefore you your use is unauthorized and infringing, and I'll sue you for copyright infringement. With open data, it's quite possible that contract law is the only thing holding it together, uh, where you might be able to say, you know, you, you agree to a license when you got this data, you're in breach of that license, um, and then your claim might be for contractual damages, but there might not be anything underlying uh, that uh, underlying that where you can't also say, well, you have to agree that you accepted this license because otherwise your use would be infringing. Okay, so um, that's the legal landscape. Um, any questions there before I go into the next section? Don't see any in the chat. It's too, too early in the morning. Okay. 
Um, so I'm just going to go over um, a few types of uh, open licenses, um, not trying to be comprehensive and list every single one. Um, there are not nearly as many open data licenses as there are open source licenses, but there are still a lot of them. Um, so at the uh, most um, permissive level, you have uh, CC0, you have the public domain dedication license. Um, you, these are licenses possibly um, you've seen in the open source space. Uh, they just, you know, the point is to disclaim all rights as completely as possible um, worldwide. And of course, that means, you know, the data could end up anywhere. And oftentimes with data, um, it's not obvious uh, where it came from. Um, if there is not like metadata or other attribution that's attached and that stays attached, um, things like, you know, a list of addresses uh, can end up in, in whatever place and you probably wouldn't be able to tell. Um, the second grouping would be attribution licenses. Um, so in the open source space, right, this is like your MIT, your BSD, your ISC. Um, in the data space, uh, you see a lot of uh, CC BY usage. Um, you uh, also see um, a lot of governments uh, use something called the open government license. Um, there are different variations. The UK has one, Canada has one. Um, I've seen a number of other countries have them. They tend to have uh, clauses specific to the country um, in those. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend um, anybody use them for their own data, but um, they are useful to look at when you're learning about the space to see, you know, commonalities um, and to see what uh, what uh, other large entities are doing. Um, there is the Open Data Commons um, Attribution License. Uh, I mentioned that because that's sort of like the the attribution only version of the open database license, which I'll talk about in detail later um, in relation to OpenStreetMap. Um, a relatively new license is the community data license agreement, um, the permissive version. There's two versions, permissive and sharing. Uh, this license came out, uh, I wanna say a year ago. Um, and I think one of the, probably the major criticism I had about it was, we really don't need another like data license, um, another open data license. Uh, I think in some ways, um, open data learned some lessons from open source about license proliferation, and in some ways they didn't. Um, because there are not nearly as many open data licenses as there are open source, where at the beginning of um, when people started using open source, everybody was writing their own license, right? Like the reason it's called MIT is because MIT <laughs> put that out there and BSD, you know, like, right? Everybody had their own. Um, and that happen hasn't happened nearly as much with open data uh, because the popularity of open data um, came about later. Um, and by that time you did see things um, like CC BY um, that were out there in this space trying to uh, imperfectly, but trying to cover this area. Um, but they did put out a couple of new licenses. This was the Linux Foundation that did this. Um, and I wouldn't, I, you know, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with uh, CDLA. Um, I think it might be a tad too, permiss too prescriptive on, um, and detailed on like metadata and attribution um, and, and those formats. But I really just think that, you know, too many licenses um, 
in general is not helpful uh, to the community at large. Um, uh, some other limitations that you might see um, in the open data space generally. Um, some of these, I think, would not fall under the definition of open um, that the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, would use, um, but it's common to see these. So um, you see a lot of researchers would put out their uh, research data sets um, for other researchers to use, um, but only uh, other academic researchers. Um, you'll see uh, some data sets as uh, CC by non-commercial. Um, you'll also see some data sets as CC by no derivatives. That one I think is a, a rather odd to use with databases given how normal it is to um, update databases uh, and to combine data. But um, some people do make that choice. Um, uh, you see uh, a lot in um, of data out there, a lot of what I call public data from counties and cities um, that's labeled personal use only. Um, a lot of uh, counties sell data um, to companies uh, for commercial use, but they also, uh, for FOIA reasons or for other reasons, um, make it available to people who, you know, to locals um, to use sort of for their own interests to, you know, kind of see what their government is up to. Um, and you'll see a lot of limitations. You know, this is for your personal non-commercial use. Um, there are some governments where um, you, you tend to see this a little more in uh, the de developmental space where there are some data sets that are out there for governments and NGOs. Um, and it's put out uh, for certain purposes um, and they make it publicly available um, in, essentially as a matter of convenience. Um, but it's, you know, not intent, it's not intended for, um, for companies, um, or even for your, like, average everyday user, but just because they don't, you know, they don't put technical controls on it. They just, like, throw it up on a website, but then label it, um, for governments and NGOs. Um, so I mentioned uh, the open database, uh, uh, the open database license uh, earlier. Um, so open database license is what you might call a weak share alike license, uh, similar to LGPL. Um, there's also uh, Creative Commons share alike, um, and then the new one, which is CDLA sharing. Uh, and the concept of these licenses um, is very similar to GPL or AGPL in the open source world, which is if you use this data, if you mix it with other data, uh, then that other data also needs to be contributed back, right? It needs to be put out there under uh, this under a share alike license so that it is also open and free for everyone to use. Um, I will note that until 4.0, the 4.0 version of Creative Commons licenses, Creative Commons licenses were not designed for data. Uh, they were really designed uh, for works that, creative works that everybody, uh, you know, thinks of when they think of Creative Commons. And one of the big issues um, in putting out the 4.0 licenses was whether they were going to try to deal with data rights um, at all. And so in many ways, um, the Creative Commons uh, suite of licenses tries to disclaim uh, database rights instead of 
really embracing them. Um, so, you know, similarly to, I think, um, the, similarly to like GPL and such in open source, um, you don't see um, these licenses used as much because they really uh, do uh, present a really strong limitations um, on usage. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, these, for example, like these licenses are not compatible with each other. So you can't take, you know, you can't make CC by SA data and slap um, a CDLA sharing license on it um, or an ODBL license on it. So even if those, even if that data is under like similarly principled licenses, you couldn't use it together. Um, any questions there before we talk about practical considerations? I have a question, um, which is, what does it mean? Um, it, you know, and I'm sure it's different license by license, but what does it mean to use data together in a way that requires permission under a license? So I know, you know, obviously in, in open source licenses, there is a specific right under copyright law, which is the right to make derivative works or collective works. And so we know, you know, why that limitation exists and sort of, sort of what the shape of it is. But, um, you know, if we have two databases that are differently licensed and, you know, we load them into separate systems, but, you know, there are lookups from both of them by the same application, is that combining the data, et cetera? So that is a very good question. Um, I will go into detail on that um, in a few slides on ODBL. Um, on the Creative Commons, right, is written for, you know, the standard copyright world. So it just says it's a derivative work. What a derivative work is in when you're looking at databases, I honestly have no idea. Um, it's not something that's been well litigated. Um, you know, you really, you really are guessing there because especially in the US, right? Because like the rights that are listed in Creative Commons uh, licenses, they really did start off with the list of US 106 rights. And so, you know, what people know what a different, mostly know what a different work in the concept of when you're talking about a book or something like that. Um, but with data, if what's protected is the arrangement and selection, then usually when you're creating a different work, the arrangement and selection is gone. Right. What you if you make a derivative of a database, or you know, what make by mixing it with something else, by um, adding elements or removing elements, usually the arrangement selection is gone. So then, you know, what that was that was copyrightable um, still exists. I don't know, and it's not something that's been well tested. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um. So. From from a practical perspective, right? Um, you're you're going to take different pieces of data. You might be kind of like pinging them side by side. You might just be combining them um, for faster search, you know, because it's probably faster. Um, you might be letting somebody query your database, right? And then uh, somebody might get a result of like ten things out of your database. Um, there you, you there are a lot of considerations about the limits of what clauses on open data can do that have not been completely figured out um and these are the limitations that i think cause the most consternation so um, attribution uh, is one. I think the open source world has actually sorted out attribution fairly well. Um, everyone knows, you know, you have your license file, um, you have your list of licenses that accompanies um, 
delivery of software. I, and, you know, if you are, if you have an app or something, you know, you go to the menu, go to legal, you go to licenses, and then, you know, there's your long list of all of the open source that the app uses, right? Um, I don't think that open data has really figured this out. Uh, you see a lot of different formats. Um, uh, academics have used like their, you know, academic citation format and other people, some people throw their open data attribution in with their open source attribution. Um, and then other people do a lot of different things. Um, and as I was saying earlier, compatibility with other uh, licenses is just, uh, is, is not solved. And, you know, this is something that is an issue in open source too, where, you know, the question of what is GPL compatible with, um, you know, and like a GPL is like compatible with like nothing. <laughs> it's, you know, uh, um, but imagine if you had, you know, GPL and then you had another uh, share alike type license where, you know, there was a lot of code in that format and you couldn't use uh, those two code under those two licenses in the same program, right? So, um, I want to use the open database license as an example. Uh, so the open database license try to solve this problem by having two concepts, one a derivative database and one a collective database. So the idea was a collective database is uh, if you have data on X and then data on Y, and you used those databases alongside each other. Uh, that was a collective database, and you did not have share alike obligations. Um, but if you mixed those uh, data type, you know, if you mix two databases together, if you used, um, if you improved a database, um, use you know. You then you were obligated to share back those improvements under ODBL. Um, so OpenStreetMap, right, has um, which is the the project that I'm heavily involved in, um, has a, a copyright page. It has an FAQ to explain attribution to explain what you can do with the data. Um, it has now seven sets of community guidelines trying to explain the difference between a derivative database and a collective database. Um, and, you know, what is um, too trivial to require um, disclosure? You know, if you, uh, for, you know, one of these examples, right, if, if you take, um, uh, if you take a map of Germany from the open from OpenStreetMap, and then you uh, take a map of France from some other source, and you use that for your map, that's considered a collective database. There is nothing in ODBL that really says any of that. Um, that is sort of like practical considerations that. The community decided thinking, okay, like it's not, you know, we want we want people to use OpenStreetMap um, and we don't want to prevent them from using OpenStreetMap just because they want to use OpenStreetMap for one country, but don't want to use OpenStreetMap for another country. So they decided to make the division at the country level. Why the country level? Why not the state level? Again, there's like nothing in the license that really explains this. Um, this was just like a practical decision that the community made. Um, the community also made the decision that um, you can 
if you use uh, the road network of OpenStreetMap, um, but you decide to get your polygons of forests and parks uh, from a different source, uh, that's okay. Uh, that's a collective database. You're not obligated to share back um, your your source of parks. Um, if you want to layer across your bird migration patterns on an OpenStreetMap map, that's okay. Um, that data type, you know, bird migration pattern is not one that's in OpenStreetMap, so it can be considered a separate layer um, and therefore a derivative database. Whereas if you uh, are using an OpenStreetMap map, uh, and then you decide to go in um, and add a bunch of roads from a new housing development that was just built. Um, then those roads um, need to be shared back. You've created a derivative database. So, you know, part, so basically, um, as far as you know, where is the line? Um, as best I can tell, OpenStreetMap is the project that has the most detail on this. And they have produced that detail out of necessity um, because the it's not obvious from just reading the text of the license. Um, and I don't know that it can ever be obvious from just reading the text of the license. Um, and, and, you know, to some extent, this is true of open source as well. I think there were just years and years of debates of, you know, what, you know, what does LGPL mean, right? Um, and the people sort of ended up with a bunch of conventions of how you were supposed to use open source and under what circumstances um, licenses were compatible. Um, and uh, OpenStreetMap has put out some, you know, quote unquote rulings about what licenses are uh, compatible with ODBL. Um, outbound ODL is compatible with basically nothing. <laughs> But inbound, um, you know, obviously things like public domain and such are inbound compatible, but um, even CC BY isn't deemed inbound compatible. You There's like a wa waiver um, that you are supposed to get um, for the DRM provision of CC BY actually. Um, so it, it is a really, really complicated question. Um, and I think it is a bit of a cautionary tale of if you decide to go into the open data space, really think about all the potential uses um, of what of the data and what you, limitations you really want um, want to have, and you know what sort of complexity that may bring about. Um, and, and one thing I will note that uh, OpenStreetMap actually started off as a CC by CC by SA project. And after a few years, they had to change the license. Uh, and they had this massive project to try to chase down literally everybody who had edited the map um, and get them to agree to the license change. And there were a bunch of people that they never found. And so they just like deleted all of their edits. Um, and this is very similar to open source projects that undergo license changes. Um, and now there is a contributor agreement <laughs> that says that the project can change the terms based on uh, a vote of uh, contributors. <laughs> Um, so a couple other clauses um, 
to pay attention to uh, that I've seen that are um, a little bit odd. Uh, but if you know a lawyer looks at the license and sees these things, it definitely you know puts a pause on usage. Um, there are some you see this with governments sometimes where they say, okay, here is the data from X date. And if you're going to use this data, you have to use the most recent version of it. Um, there are some governments, uh, especially, that'll put out data that say it can only be used in the country um, that that it originated from. Uh, and then there are some licenses that say um, either that the license can be revoked at any time or that the license is only good for a year or something. Like that. Um, you see a lot of indemnity clauses in, um, especially in, in government licenses, uh, where um, a lot of times they're concerned about, what they're concerned about is if the data is inaccurate for any reason, and then it gets used for, um, you know, cap, like, like somebody uses as the basis of this like a survey or something, like a land survey or something like that. Um, they, you know, they don't want to get sued. And so they're like, if you use it um, and we get sued, then you indemnify us. Um, I think most companies can get comfortable with this, um, just a matter of risk, but it is something to, to know about. Um, Another other considerations. Um, this is a sp uh, depends on the type of data that you might put out as open data, but you do really have to be careful um, about whether there's any uh, information about individuals in your data. Um, you know, names, uh, email addresses, uh, right? Um, that sort of information. I uh, and. You know, uh, I think for researchers, um, they tend to worry a lot, a lot about um, medical data, for example. Um, there is uh, sometimes copyright associated with individual pieces of a database. Um, so, for example, if you have a database of photographs, there will be copyright for each individual photograph, even if uh, the copyright on the grouping um, is very limited. Uh, and trademark is, uh, you know, similar issues, right, uh, as when you're talking about um, any information that's going out there, you know, who, who, where is this originating from? Who is it responsible? Um, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, practical considerations for if you are putting data out there, um, uh, making sure that you have information that's clear um, and obvious to the viewer and to anybody who might download uh, the data. Um, this is just very similar to open source best practices, um, but uh, I think you know, with, uh, with data and metadata can be very important. Um, and also you tend to see a lot of academics. Um, so academic uh, citations tends to be a question that comes up a lot. Um, so when you're using open data, um, your considerations are a lot of the same, um, but, uh, your a lot of the concern is about finding the information on data, and this is not always obvious. Sometimes you'll just see, you know, data sitting out there, uh, especially if it's coming from a government entity. Um, a lot of times, uh, these entities don't aren't familiar with the concept of open data. Like some uh, entities, like the city of San Francisco, have like a you know, open data portal, it's very easy. Um, and other entities uh, have um, have like a term sheet or something like that. Um, and it can really take some digging 
to find out this sort of information um, to figure out uh, what the limitations are. Um, and just because there are so many, because people use open data to mean so many different things, like, you know, all of, we just reviewed all of these different licenses, right? Um, just because somebody says open data doesn't necessarily mean it's suitable for your use case. Um, as I said, you know, you really want to um, find out what the terms are and ask, you know, who produced something um, and, and specific restrictions. Um, if you, you know, one question that I see sometimes um, with OpenStreetMap is people will ask, you know, is this, uh, is the license for this data compatible with ODBL? And most of the time, the people being asked have no idea what ODBL is. So it just ends up um, not being a useful question. Um, and of course, right, this is just best practices, um, very similar to open source um, in making sure that when you're using open data, uh, you have a good record of where you got the data, um, what license it's under. Um, and questions. I have another question if nobody else wants to go first. Okay, um, my question is um, a, a hard one, um, but to what extent do you see share alike or copyleft data licenses being effective for their sort of original purpose? In other words, where they, they do a better job of bringing new contributions into the project than they do of um, scaring potential users and contributors away from the project? Um, I think that for the most part, um, if you have a license that's too restrictive, that will keep people away. Um, I think what you see, for example, is you don't, it is AGPL is not nearly as conducive to a large scale, very popular project um, as a, a permissive license, right? And GPL, um, you know, you, you have like the huge example, but you don't have a lot of examples. Um, and OpenStreetMap, you know, struggles with whether the license is too restrictive or not. Um, there are definitely circumstances where, you know, open street map data might be used for something, but it's not used uh, because it's not compatible with other data um, that that's available. Um, but for, but it does, it does force um, people, uh, you know, especially companies to, to make this choice, right, of like, either you're kind of all in or you're not. Um, because if you're, if you want to use the data, then you're going to need to contribute resources to improving that data. Um, because, you know, you, you want a better map. Um, and you, then you have to give back um, those improvements. Uh, but like I said, OpenStreetMap found basically that CC by SA was too restrictive. And that's why it moved to ODBL. Um, and at the time that it moved to ODBL, there were people who were saying, you know, this should be like CC by. Um, and so, you know, my view is the most restrictive uh, data license really just aren't usable. Um, and the an ODBL is only usable for certain types of projects. Um, you know, 
OpenStreetMap has a lot of individual contributors. It also has a lot of companies that are um, coordinating. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for a project that is um, a lot of different companies, like just, just like a few companies working together primarily. Um, I think those companies could just um, write like a, a data sharing agreement between them. And I think for, in general, for, for like a, a project where um, you, you know, you just are putting some data out there and you want people to use it. Um, I think we're better off using the more permissive uh, licenses. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a question now from a participant. Um, Kevin, do you wanna go ahead and ask yourself? Sure, hi Kathleen. Um, so one one question um, that's kind of a tangent, I guess, to, to, to how you're describing the success of these open data projects. Um, have you seen any examples where, as instead of providing just access to the raw data under whatever license, um, you provide access to the data via specific access patterns, you know, APIs and, and that sort of thing? Um, and and by, the, by the same token, you know, if, if you ask for contributions back to your data, you provide specific access patterns um, um, to, to do that. Um, sure. That yeah. So. Those things are not mutually exclusive, right? Um, you can access OpenStreetMap via uh, API. Um, you can also just download the entire planet file. That takes a while. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes what you do see, especially with government, for example, is they will have their data viewable um, through like their own viewer uh, on their website um, and such. I I don't consider that to be open data if it's sort of like subject to the terms and service, you know, terms of service of the website or whatever, right? Um, you can you can ping the data, um, you can get the data. Uh, I I don't really consider that very different than kind of any website uh, where there's information on the website. Um, it might be easy to scrape. It might be hard to scrape. Uh, it's in a lot of ways just a standard terms of service. Gotcha. No, yeah. I mean, we were specifically looking at some scenarios where we would um, potentially open source the data access method itself. For example, all the APIs and so forth, and provide um, you know something more along the lines of a Kafka streaming subscription type of a thing, right? So that um, it it would go a lot further than than just um, what you could get through scraping, for example. You know, you could get larger volumes of data. It's just because of the, the data itself is intrinsically difficult to interpret. Providing it in specific um, formats would be extremely helpful for consumers is, is kind of the way we were looking at it. Yeah, and, you know, that, that can definitely be the case for certain types of data. Um, and like I said, right, I don't think it's a either or. Um, Providing data in a more useful format, like based on um, what the user queries, uh, you know that that can be very helpful. Um, and I, if your goal is to make the data more accessible, then I think that it's best to have both options available. Um, you know, you can have the API where people can have ease of both getting the information and adding information, right? So like with OpenStreetMap, um, you can get a stream of change sets of every minute, every all the edits that are have been added to the map. And when you make a change to the map, that gets sent to the map as a change set, right? And, and then the map is immediately updated. So you're not, you know, downloading and uploading the entire planet um, or anything like that. But you can, you can and go get the entire thing um, if, if you want. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, that makes sense. I appreciate the discussion. Um, other questions? Okay. 
Well, we are past the hour, so um, I, I guess if you are if you are game to stick around for those who are around and still have questions, um, then I, I will say that you know folks can stick around if they'd like to. Um, but I I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for joining us. This was a terrific presentation. Um, I think you estimated that you no way you would go forty minutes uh, to me before this <laughs> presentation, but clearly we we. We made it to the end. So thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your sharing your expertise. Oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I guess if anybody has any, any uh, last uh, questions. Let me ask. Yeah, if I may ask, um, uh, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. And I think we are now thinking about some of this data protection regulation coming up, right? Uh, GDPR, the... Uh, the, from California as well. I'm from Brazil. I work for a Brazilian bank, and there's also a regulation for data protection. Do you see that this open data uh, licenses has picked up because of this data protection regulation that people need to know where the data came from, how the data is being used? And as consumer of proprietary data, of data in general, do you see companies putting together into the same big initiative to see data um, governance as a whole? Um, I don't think that open data has picked up because of pri data privacy laws. Um, I think that there is um, a consideration, there should be a consideration of data privacy laws when one opens up data. Like you have to think about what type of data you're opening up and whether the data you have is suitable for opening up given data privacy laws, but I don't see people moving to open data because of data privacy laws. Is that your question? Mm, I see. I understood. Yeah, I see interesting uh, initiatives like, uh, I guess it was MasterCard that was selling their anonymized, uh, anonymized data, right? So in that regard, if you treat the data even though it's from customers or from other sources, uh, would you still be subject to, it depends on the license, right? Of the, maybe the source, right? Yeah, but as, yeah, I don't have a, a straightforward question, but I was thinking about how people has monetizing on data and how sometimes they anonymize customers' data and other data uh, from other sources and how the open data plays a role in it. Um, yeah, so data anonymization, um, you, you know, the, the privacy consideration there is you have to do it in the right way. Um, you have to, you don't, data protection laws are, look, are look, starting to look harder and harder at, are you actually anonymizing that data um, that you're selling? And from the perspective of the data privacy laws of like, you know, what is concerning, uh, whether that data is being sold or that data is freely available, you know, those privacy concerns are, are still there. Um, many years ago, there was um, a web, uh, I think it was AOL, but I might, it might've been a different company that put out, um, a giant database base of people's web searches. Uh, and it was anonymized, there was no names attached to it. But what researchers found was based on somebody's web searches, they could figure out who these people are and track them down. Um, and they went and interviewed this one old lady who had you know, searched for like her, her friends and like their illnesses, like their, their medical complaints. <laughs> Um, and search her address, you know, and, and search her neighbors. Uh, and the reporters found her and, and interviewed her. Um, and so, you know, that data, it, I'm sure there is monetization potential for that type of data. But in that case, the company put it out there thinking that it would be interesting to researchers. So they put it out there for free. Um, and they learned a lesson about, you know, privacy considerations. And I think everybody learned a lesson about privacy considerations coming out of that. I see. Understood. Yeah, thank you very much.
Okay, great. I think we can call it. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Thanks so much. Thank you.